Well, we are studying the end times. So, and uh, Kevin, Kevin requested that. And I think you are mostly interested in A-mill, pre-mill, blah, blah, blah stuff. We'll get to that. That's probably five lessons away, but <laughs> we're I just thought I'm going to do a good treatment of it. So <coughs> we looked at how do we view the future, and today we're going to look at, well, we're th since we don't know the date of Christ's return, which was last week's lesson, we live in a state of, of readiness, as Scripture tells us to do. So that's what today's lesson is on. So we'll, uh, some passages will be printed out, others we'll look up, it just, um, you know, I just didn't want to constantly be. So for reading more than one verse, we'll look it up. And if it's just one verse, it'll be printed in the lesson that way. Okay? Um, but so the intro starts out, curiosity stirs in the human heart. And I think that's reasonable, isn't it? I mean, especially when we're kids, things m might happen in life where we will learn not to be curious. But th I think that's more of a learned trait, isn't it? that not to be curious, because that's how we learn and that's how we adapt. So uh, when I was in the military and I dealt with top secret stuff, I didn't want to know anybody else's business because the military crushes all that curiosity out of you. If you don't need to know it, you don't even want to ask. And then you put all that stuff in that part of your brain and you forget it. So, which was really helpful being a pastor. With counseling, everything goes to that same part of the brain and it's gone. So I kind of like that. Okay, so we have curiosity, and Christ's disciples are no different because they want to know stuff. Of course, today, based on the subject matter, what do we know that they're curious about? Yeah, the, the last time. When is all this stuff going to happen, right? Because <clears throat> Jesus did tell them of things that would happen in the future, and they go, well, uh, and so, of course, they're curious, and they're going to ask, right? So let's turn to Matthew 24, because this will be one of those. Okay. <clears throat> so I have my little sticky here to Daniel. I'll, I'll remove that. So all right. So let's look at the let's look at the first first three verses in Matthew 24. All right. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point to him the buildings of the temple. So then the temple still wasn't completely built. There were still parts being built, even though for the, you know, most of it was all there. So, <coughs> which is, you know, you think, wow, you know, in 40 years, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so, and they're marveling at it because it really was. So it really was a huge, um, it was so big that, you know, the Wailing Wall today, right? It's called the Wailing Wall because that's what's left of the temple that was destroyed in 70 A.D. But the temple was so big that they had to, in a sense, you see the topography around here, right? Well, you build anything more than 10 feet, you're going to have to either remove soil or berm something up. And so it's that same sort of thing, right? So they had to, they had to basically... That's the wall. That was a retra retaining wall. And then they filled the rest up with rock and whatnot. And they built the temple atop that. So it was so big that it didn't all fit on, you know, the Jerusalem's holy hill, as it were. Okay. So the disciples are all there and they're marveling at the temple. I mean, it, it really was an architectural wonder. So what did, what did Jesus say? But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So the question really put together what Jesus just said, but also other stuff that he taught them. Right. And so they're saying, when is all of this going to happen? Right curiosity okay so not strange at all okay so the word for sign okay um, often not always 
but often heralds some significant or sometimes miraculous event. And that's how the disciples are using it. What sign? They're expecting something really momentous to kind of say, oh, well, now is, right? That will let us know that this is happening. So they kind of want to have a clue, okay? So they're no different than we are, right? I mean, if we were not curious, if we didn't want to figure out the things when this might happen, wouldn't church history be different? Because I think we all know in our lifetimes what has happened, at least on a couple different occasions. Somebody says, oh, well, Christ is going to be returning. And everybody went up on a hill or I don't know what it was. I think the was the last one, was that Harold Camping? Was that the, the one that at least was most well known I think and he was actually quite a scholar on all this stuff and so I think he fell into depression when it didn't happen um, but um, I think he was the guy I believe yeah yeah so <coughs> but a couple things just because well okay let's just contemplate these what drives our fascination with future events we're curious we want to know it's how we're wired okay so that inclination itself is not wrong, okay? Uh, so in, in a sense, if we, if we take that kind of inborn inclination and we shape it properly, it helps us live, what, awaiting Christ's return, okay? How might foreknow- foreknowledge of Christ's return reshape our faith journey? Well, let me ask it a different way. Why do you think we're not given to know when he will return? Yeah, yeah. Um, has anybody ever done the crazy uh, term paper thing in college? <laughs> you have all, you have the entire quarter to work on it, and then three days before, right? And so, so when I was when I was um, <coughs> getting my degree, Sherry and I were seeing each other, and so I said, Sherry, you're not going to see me because I have a term paper. And I would lock myself in, and I wouldn't leave until I was done. (laughs) So, yeah. (coughs) But So, um, that could happen. Oh, well, Christ is coming in 15 years. Well, I'll goof off for 14. Mm -hmm. Right? So, there was this this one person in the church uh, who really had it. Tertullian, I believe, was his name in the early church. And he had this weird, well, he didn't have a weird idea. He had a weird conclusion. He believed what Scripture says, that baptism saves, that it forgives your sins, right? So he said, okay, well, since it does all that, but he had a, he understood sin really kind of in a linear human way, not as God does as God in eternity outside of time. So he says, well, if that's the case, then you should wait and get baptized as close as you can before you die. Because that way, you'll die and you'll be forgiven, right? So, anyway, so he got, he understood what baptism does, didn't he? Because otherwise, why would he come up with something so wacky? But, right, it was an improper conclusion, okay? So, but that was that same sort of thing, okay? But the trick with that is, well, what if you die, right? Right? Before, oh, well, it was unexpected, in, right? So, <coughs> yeah, just kind of interesting, okay? So Augustine of Hippo, okay, um, so, he, this is, so he, he basically said that not knowing the day is kind of God's way of just helping us remain vigilant. That was his take on that, okay? So as an intro let's turn to acts chapter one because we know acts chapter one is what happens in acts chapter one same thing that happens at the end of luke so uh, somebody people are standing around and their mouths are agape and they're looking up in the sky as as uh someone right uh goes away from them okay so (coughs) yeah Jesus' ascension, okay? 40 days after his resurrection, right? 10 days after that, Holy Spirit comes, Pentecost, okay? So, let's, Acts chapter 1, let's look at verses 6 through 7. 
So when they had come together, th these are the disciples, okay, slash apostles, okay. So <coughs> Luke, Luke um, refers to the disciples as apostles way earlier than the other gospels do. But, um, okay. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, what will you at this, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay. Do we know the whole backdrop of that? So they're asking something, but they're still, they're still on the wrong track. They're thinking Jesus is going to set up a kingdom on earth. Well, now that you've died and now that you've conquered death, right? Now are you, you know, so, <clears throat> and so when we read parts when it says, the disciples did not know this till, yeah, because they're still th being nationalistic here, okay? Are you going to do this? And it's like, oh, wow. See, we have the advantage of hindsight, hindsight so we don't, Otherwise, we'd probably just as be as just as stupid as they are. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. So he kind of sideswipes the question just a little bit and gives them, shall we say, the answer to a better question if they had asked it when that was kind of um, related to that. Right. So Jesus does that when Nicodemus comes to visit. Right, John chapter 3, Nicodemus is like, oh, he finally sees Jesus. Well, we know you have to be a man from God because nobody could do the stuff you're doing unless God is with him. And then Jesus says, oh, does he say, well, well, thank you. I'm glad you got it. No, he says, unless one is born from water and spirit, right? Or one, unless one is born from above, he thinks that Jesus is meaning a second time based on an oath in the Greek, at least that's used in the text, um, uh, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And what? Two different conversations. But see, Jesus is answering probably the question Nicodemus should have asked, right? Instead of being dazzled by the stuff that really didn't matter in eternal things, right? He's saying these are the real miracles. They don't look like it. And he hadn't even instituted baptism. And then later on in the conversation, he talks about uh, dying on, you know, dying as a sacrifice for the worlds of the sin. He hasn't yet gone to the cross, right? But that's, that's where he, he takes that and answers the question he should have asked, right? The real thing you should be impressed by, right? For us, looking back, word and sacrament, right? So he's, in this case, he's mentioning baptism, right? And then later on, the belief that one gets from the Holy Spirit, okay? So, um, so Jesus is kind of doing that. He's answering the question, but not directly. He's answering the question they should have asked, or at least something more related to that. Okay? So, <coughs> in other words, he's not establishing the kingdom of Israel, right? Not as they were thinking. Okay? So, <coughs> but, uh, and then on page two, I just talked about times and seasons and how that kind of applies okay back to Matthew 24 concerning the day and hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven nor the son but the father alone and we went over that uh, in the previous lesson so in whatever way that God works right Jesus doesn't even know so there could be a couple things is this Jesus in his human nature which is Kevin asked concerning that and I said well that's what I say but actually I'm cheating because we don't know exactly and so I'm doing a little bit of a weasel but okay or is Jesus speaking hyperbolically just to make the point right he doesn't know but the main point is is if Jesus doesn't know then who are we right and so right he's the master we're the students and if he doesn't know we're we don't know we're not going to know and in a sense we shouldn't even try to know just be content with god has made known to us right so god has seen fit not to tell us 
So we're living in this state of not knowing that it could be today or it could be in 10,000 years. Okay? So, um, so in the early church, this paragraph on page, I think it's page two, whatever, uh, a fervent anticipation of Christ's return colored the lives of believers. That's true. A lot of people thought, oh, it's going to happen soon. And, and then, of course, it didn't. And then it didn't. And so, you know, the church kind of um, changed in a way how people approach things because um, look at the early church where uh, in Jerusalem they all sold their things and put it together, right? Um, in a way, some of that was based on, well, Christ is going to return, so, right? And so, and so, did, but when Christ didn't return, what ended up happening to the church in Jerusalem when they did that? See, sharing their items in common necessarily wasn't bad, but what happens if you sell your land, which was your source of income? So what is Paul doing later? Well, we need to help, we need to help Mama Church in Jerusalem because, right? It's like they, you know, they cut off their ability to earn income and now they're all in a bad way, see? So it didn't really work as an economic model, right? So um, it, this would kind of be like, uh, I hope this doesn't sound wrong, this would be like communism with religion because communism was, a you know, no religion. The, nobody has a God except the state. That's really the commu communist thinking, right? Um, so in a sense... They did all this, and it, you could think, wow. And something like that might work in the family, but why doesn't it work on a bigger level? Like if we share all our items, why, doesn't, why, does, it, why does everybody end up being poor? I think it would be pretty obvious. I, 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 Mike, you're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Or they come here for medical treatment because they have to wait too long. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the reason why is, well, I would say um, you notice the effect, but we have a sinful nature, right? And so, well, you know, so in a sense, we kind of, that model doesn't work. A, a family unit, it could work because we're all related. It's a smaller, right? It, all of that. And so those models actually don't work because we have a sinful nature, right? And so, <coughs> so when we kind of look at, well, I, I guess if we look at our own history, our nation was founded recognizing that. That's why we have three forms of government where if each one operates in its own self-interest, it'll help keep the other two from getting too powerful and tyrannical, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, capitalism actually w operates on the fact that there is greed, right? So, so, well, we can't get rid of it, so let's try to channel it towards something that benefits most people. So, um, so yeah, it, that, that didn't work, okay? Um, so, uh, and I, I guess, so we, it shouldn't, that shouldn't keep us from being generous. That shouldn't keep us from helping people. But we need to operate with a, right? God also has given us reason and sensibilities and all of that is in service to the gospel. Uh, so, but I would not say, let's sell everything. And, right, well, that didn't work. And so, you know, and w it's, it's even recorded in Scripture that it didn't work. So you can say, so their theological intentions weren't bad, but they didn't quite execute it properly. So, are we ready to continue? Okay. Back to Matthew 24. Okay. 
So we, Matthew 25, that's the famous uh, chapter. I think more, most people are familiar with that, right? That's when the, la- you know, the sheep and the goats and standing before Christ. And so, so 24 is, is really kind of what precedes that. <coughs> okay, so let's look at 37 through 44. Now this, and there's also other passages that say something similar, but this is very important because this is one thing that if you understand it only in English, in fact, the English only understanding actually sounds better than what I'm going to say later on because it's in, we're reading it in English with English language, right? English language worldview and assumptions and all of that. So 24, 37 to 44. <coughs> I'll start with 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And now Jesus goes on. He's going to give a comparison, right? For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until... Th- so who's the they here? It's, it's the people other than Noah and his family. Like, right? So they're living as if Right now, Noah had told them, but whatever, you're, the guy's crazy. He's a crazy old man. He's saying stuff I've never seen. Where does he get this nonsense, right? So everyone's living as if, right? <coughs> until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So it's not only that we won't know the date or time, but what will we be? What? That stuff was real. I thought Noah was a, was a crazy man, right? So basically the world will go, what? That old myth about, gee, that's real? Same thing. So for that to happen, it's implied, it's not stated, what will be the state of belief in the world? There'll still be a vestige of Christianity where people could go, what? But, yeah, but so right now, Christianity is the large, world's largest religion, okay? Islam is number two, and then I don't know who's number three, so on and so forth. But my guess is I don't think Christianity will be the, pop size-wise because otherwise, right? Why would it be like in the days of Noah? Because if Christians are living in expectation, we shouldn't be surprised. Oh, today's the day right oh i've been living my whole life for this okay so let's continue on okay two men will be in a field one will be taken and one left sometimes that's translated left behind and hence the left behind series right isn't there a whole book and movie series on that left behind yeah and it's based on this there's also a passage in luke that you know that that uses the same words Okay. Two women will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one left, one left behind. Therefore, okay, okay, so since that's going to happen, what's the deal? Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Okay, so it's, this is another comparison. It's like a thief, right? Breaking, well, if I knew the thief was going to do that, right? Well, if I knew this could happen, I wouldn't have. But we don't know, right? So we just make a choice based on limited information, okay? So um, 44, therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So we don't expect it. We'll be surprised, or at least the world in general will, Okay? So let's kind of let's kind of tear this apart because in English it's pretty clear to me if I'm reading this from English, right? What's going on here? Right? Two men will be in a field, field one will be taken and one left, one left behind. That sounds like one's gone and one's still doing his job. Okay? Well, <coughs> If that's the case, then 
Um, why should we be ready because we don't know when the Son of Man is coming? In that scenario, we go, oh, because we'll be the ones taken, right? I mean, at least that, that's the way it's understood. We're not the ones left behind. At least I haven't read any, right? But we'll see, because uh, I'll have to reread all that stuff, and maybe there will be a sub-wrinkle in there somewhere. Oh, well, let's t- we'll hang tight. We'll, we'll look at, all I'm saying is that when we read this in English, th- when you know this whole idea that there's going to be a rapture and somebody's taken and people are left behind that sounds reasonable here right i mean in english it sounds the most reasonable now that doesn't match up with other parts of scripture so then you're going to have to say oh well how do we reconcile those and that's kind of the right but if we understand this in the original language we won't have to reconcile it with the other things Okay, so back to the lesson, swept them all away. Okay, so that's that's the verb for lift up or remove. And so it's really just kind of saying what? It's portraying the suddenness of Christ's return. Well, no wonder everyone will be oh, surprised, right? One will be taken, one will be left. Okay, taken's pretty clear. We don't know exactly who's taken or where, but that in English and the Greek, same thing, taken. What's different in the Greek is the word for left behind. That's the same word for forgiven. The text is not saying one is taken and one is left behind. One is taken and one is forgiven. Whoa. They're both taken, if you want to use that. But one is forgiven and one isn't. That's the difference, see? So there isn't a rapture when, loop, and, whoa, where'd the other guy go? Well, I guess I'll rototill the garden myself, right? Um, so, <coughs> but it's a Troy-built rototiller, so it works well. Um, <coughs> so, but yeah, so it's really um, one's forgiven, one's taken, and that changes the entire thing. So, because for I can't help it, Janet, the way people translate. I mean, f- forgiveness literally means left behind. So when Christ says your sins are forgiven you, what he's really saying is your sins are left behind. They're not sticking to you anymore. They don't cling to you. So, you know, it's not like, you know, so it's, it's not the monkey on your back. It's, it's gone. See, that's the... So, so I guess you can say your sins are left behind. I think we'd get that by context, wouldn't we? But yeah, that's the, but th- so the translators, they, they're looking at this and they're thinking, well, one's taken and one's left behind. So they translate it that way. The thing is, you don't ha- in English, you don't even have a chance because you don't know the deal. All you know is what you read in English. And then you go, oh, you mean that's the same word for forgiven? And that's, that changes everything in the sense that now when we go read something in Thessalonians or whatever, we don't have to go, oh, well, we don't have to explain that away because it's fairly clear there, right? Believers and unbelievers are both, okay? So, um, and let's turn to 1 Thessalonians. Okay. So that is... Um, Remember that, because that's the one thing um, that you're not going to get from the, from the text in English. And so if you don't know the, the word behind it, then you know, you're not going you're not going to get that. So So first Thessalonians, and let's turn to chapter five. okay? So. Now, concerning the times and seasons, did we not hear that phrase before? Yeah, so it's the same sort of, right? It's, it's, you're using, it's a, a phrase, okay? It's concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 
That was one of the uh, ways Jesus described it. So yeah, of course they would. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will, and they will not escape. So it sounds as if, right, if Christ returns, doesn't it sound like that it's not like, oh, well, half are taken or whatever it is and the rest are doing everything else and the world stays the same? But what's Thessalonians saying? Then sudden destruction. Okay? So if the rapture is a lot of people say, oh, Christians are taken and unbelievers are here. Well, according to Thessalonians, if they're left behind, they're destroyed in the, right? The world's destruction. I mean, what are you going to say they're not? So, um, but that's not what happens in this scenario. I don't want to dig too deep because we're going to study that more in depth. But this is just to let you know that um, the understanding of one taken and one physically left behind doesn't match other parts of Scripture. But one taken, one forgiven, that makes perfect sense. Right? Okay. So, so we don't have to bend over backwards elsewhere in Scripture to try to explain, you know, Matthew and Luke about one physically taken and one physically being left behind. Okay? So, <coughs> all right. So, okay. So, oh yeah, I, I remember, I wrote this yesterday. I remember that because I was thinking, what, hey, what, is there anything else that we can kind of use? So, this is the example I used, but it's not as strong as the flood. But it's the only thing I could think of. Consider a world-changing event like a global pandemic. It arrives unannounced, altering our lives overnight. This helps us better understand the unexpected nature of Christ's return, urging us to remain spiritually vigilant and prepared. Right? Nobody was expecting this. We knew theoretically a pandemic could happen, but it came along and now everybody's life has changed. Our life as a nation has changed. Right? So, um, and uh, whatever... President Bush had prepared for pandemics, was lost and forgotten, so we had to reinvent the wheel. Um, so how do these help illuminate the nature of Christ's return? Well, okay, um, let's be alert, and it happens when it happens, okay? So, okay, so we have Noah's flood, the whole pandemic thing. So both scenarios that I just mentioned Unanticipated occurrence catching the unprepared off guard. They involve sudden unexpected events that catch people unprepared. What constitutes readiness for this momentous event? How are we ready? Well, well one, don't try to figure out the date because that's really obvious that that's not for us to know. So we're, we're wasting energy. Right. We, so live our life as if Christ could come today or in 10,000 years, but never forgetting that he could return today. Okay. So that's how we live. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 that's, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but, but, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing is there's, there's, you have to explain something away, but, it's really hard, though. It's really hard to explain one is taken and one is left behind. I mean, that's, in English, that's pretty clear. So if you had, so you wouldn't want to explain away that one because, well, that one's clear. Let me explain something that's less clear. See? Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the average layperson who reads Scripture and gets a, re comes to that, well, yeah, that's, I, I think, if anything bothers me, it's, it's as if the pastors, come on, guys, really? I mean, 
Are you going to toe the party line when you know when you know the Greek is saying something else, and then it just whatever. Okay. Well, yeah, exactly. But pastors, come on, really? I mean, well, okay, never mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean when one with death? Yeah, but spirit, you know, so the spirit is taken, right? Not the uh, not the flesh. So, I mean, the, the whole point of the resurrection is that body and soul will be reunited. Right. So when God created Adam, he breathes into Adam and uh, he became a living nephesh. So nephesh would be like, um, well, we say soul, which I think is the best translation, but. Soul has stuff that that's not that's not um, like life force, right? So in other words, Adam became alive because God breathed into him. But then what Adam was, it was a body and soul being, right? And so that was the way that God created us, and that was the way we were to be forever. Okay, sin comes along, and and so our our flesh is now sinful. So. You know, God cleaves the spirit or s- from the flesh and reunites it on in at the resurrection. OK, um, so um, because right now we kind of look at it and we go, well, by the time we die. Most of us die if we if we live a good long life, we're probably pretty ready to say good ridden spotty, right? <laughs> You've made life hard enough for me as it is. I'll be glad when I get rid of this sack of bones, right? So it's easy for us to imagine a reality where we don't have to mess with the, all the stuff of the body that's just, um, that's too high maintenance, right? And it's sucking the joy out of life uh, because of the problems that come um, as we continue to degrade and, and whatnot. But we're missing the point that that's not, God created us body and soul. But the experience of body and soul in the future will be different. And I we can't even relate to it because we've never even known anything like that. So our experience here, I think, will just tell us. I'm okay with having no body, which is pretty much where the Protestant world is today. Resurrection. What's the big deal about that? Right. But the end state of being is not our souls in heaven. Okay, so. I'm not sure if we're going to have a lesson on that or not, because <laughs> I haven't planned that far ahead. So, OK, mm. let's let's turn to first Peter. OK, so. Uh, and then. So. OK, so these are the only two only two texts from Peter. So. OK. Verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action be so, uh, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the revelation of Jesus Christ? Second coming, his return, right? All, all synonyms for that. So, you know, the big event in after Christ's death and resurrection is his return. Okay, that's huge in the new in the New Testament, right? I mean, you can't shake a stick without, you know, every few chapters coming across some reference for that. Okay, as obedient children, do we do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Okay, so preparing your minds for action means girding the loins of your mind. So um, think about the uh, prodigal son, right? So dad, he's waiting for his son to return. He goes out and he's looking every day, right? He sees his son and he runs out to hug him. Welcome home, son, right? How did he do that? He's well-to-do. He has farm workers all over, right? His sons are doing stuff, but he's the wealthy landowner. He girds his loins, right? So imagine it would be like, you know, they're wearing a robe, kind of like an alb that I wear, but the alb is really more ceremonial. 
a ceremonial form of that. So, you know, he pull it up, hike it, and then run, see, because you don't want to trip, see. So if you're wealthy and you do that, well, you know, it's kind of unbecoming of you, right, <laughs> to, to uh, you don't have to do that because you have people who will do that for you, right? So that's kind of, if you, if you were the elite of the day, you're not going to, why, you're not going to do that, right? Um, but that's the, but see, that's the girding up the loins of your mind, right? So it's that same idea of just being ready, okay? Um, and it's not um, that, in this sense, it's not so passive, right? It's kind of a mindset that we have that is kind of stirring within us. It's not just in the back recesses as an abstract possibility. That's kind of what that expression is saying, okay? So, um, our calling is not, lies not in predicting Christ's return, but in living in constant readiness through faith in Christ Jesus, okay? So, this is, I have a Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote, which is probably his most famous quote, right? If you've ever read any of, of Bonhoeffer, he was um, a German Christian. He was martyred in World War II just a few months before the end of the war. So, um, yeah, I mean, that happened to, yeah, a lot of people. Um, so we have a hymn um, by Jochen Klemper in our hymn book, Good Hymn. Um, but it's kind of a really kind of a dark hymn because he also was martyred shortly before the war was over. I'm just like, wow. But Bonhoeffer, right? When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Okay. So, um, and the idea of that is what? We don't have to die for our sins. Christ did. That's contrary to what Paul says, right? Live your life as a living sacrifice. Right? Which means what? What's dying? The old sinful nature. Does the old sinful nature really die? Well, not as long as we have this body. But that's the, right? That's the whole imagery of baptism. We're buried with Christ in, into his death. Baptism does that. Baptism drowns the old man. Okay? So, and Luther's joke was what? Well, but the old man is such a good swimmer. So, um, so every day, <laughs> so every day when you get up, you know, so he, he would say, um, <clears throat> make the sign of the cross, right? And then um, pray the morning prayer um, or the Our Father, you know, as he would say, um, and, um, and drown the old Adam, right? So, which is what? Repentance. Repentance and forgiveness. That's how that happens, okay? So trust in God's timing, immerse yourself in God's word. Christ-focused worships help nur nurture a healthy perspective. So if you're getting the goods that you're supposed to be getting, because like I knew you guys got a lot of weird stuff, a lot of stuff that you share with me. I'm, I'm actually appalled that I just think somebody just made stuff up. I, some of it that I've heard. I'm like, where did, what? You know, it's like, you can't even find anything close to that in scripture. <laughs> but there it is. Um, so that scenario is not good because you're getting bad juju. You're getting stuff which... Um, so let me, let me ask you guys because when you think of the end times before, before you became Lutheran, was it something that you looked forward to or was it something... Was it an anxiety-causing thing or was it neither? More like anxiety? More like anxiety? So why why would? Mm -hmm. But if you read the scriptures and stuff, you wonder where they got that at because mm. one doesn't line up with the other. You know. Yeah, but we don't. <laughs> we don't want to go there right now. I just want to say, what was your state of mind concerning this? Um, there was a lot of people because of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't have what you have up here with your plan. Mm. Like, you know, you don't sit in front of us. Well, oh. You know, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can't find that, you know. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're trying to teach you a lot of them out here. If you don't do this, you don't have the Holy Spirit. 
Mm, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's the, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. 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 Yeah, that that is kind of weird how, how they, I mean, there's one thing to be prepared, but how do we be prepared? Well, it's not by uh, buying, obsessing, knowing he could return any time, but then what do we do? Well, we live life. We do the stuff that we're given to do. We live in our vocations. We serve our neighbor. Well, that's uh, the salvation well yeah. okay, but I mean, <laughs> you know, so that's the. You have to, you have to literally do. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, some, yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, um, I think some of that is in, some of that is in kind of the, th- the theology because on nursing home visits you know I'd visit a parishioner right and of course she had a roommate and a couple times they were kind of of the the kind of the Pentecostal persuasion so I'm chatting and so two different women have said basically well I can't let my pastor know I'm here and I'm like well why not right I mean hello isn't that part of his job (laughs) And it's like, well, he's going to say I don't have enough faith. I'm like, what? Uh, he's go- he might end up in a nursing home. Uh, I mean, if you live long enough, your body's going to fail you. And, it, and that testifies to the, to the reality that we live in a fallen world and have fallen flesh. It doesn't mean that you don't believe enough. What about Lazarus? Jesus raised him. Well, oh, you can't die now. You don't have enough faith because Jesus raised you from the dead, so you can't die. I mean, it's absurd. Um, yeah. Well, it's... So, I just think some of it is... Well, okay, yeah, I'm not... Uh, this is not a slam somebody else fest. I, I was just trying to get a take on... on uh, but I think some of this may be based on stuff they may have heard but because because some of it you go how could you get that from scripture that's the part that that leaves me scratching my head right so mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. Well, I remember as a kid because, um, so, I, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, but, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, wow, okay. Hmm. And the only church that the, the pastor made, and we, this is when we were kids, we went with our neighbor, because she only lived in the city. So we went with our neighbor, sat there, and when she, if you did not, your parents weren't there, he made the kids sit on the front row. He just wanted to make sure they got their attention. Hmm. Well, I kind of like that church. Hmm. You know? Yeah. So this is when you were a child. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I I just asked Kevin and Janet because they're true Ozarkians, and so you know, and so you know, you guys grew up in a different religious atmosphere, so that's the reason why I'm I, I kind of. Uh, so when I was growing up, um, I was raised Baptist, and so um, I wouldn't say there was there was a, an obsession, but there was a whole lot of end times focus. And I don't know whether that was the time period or not, um, whether it's still that way now. 
but um, but yeah, it was at least it was a but it was it. I just saw it as as this really kind of uh, horrific event. Uh, and so in a sense, I just kind of got that it was really something scary, which yeah, but that but that's my kid emotional and that may not be the actual theology. So I have to but I'm just saying that was my take on it. Um, kind of growing up so okay but um, you know the thing is for uh, so the end times right when Christ returns that's something we look forward to because it's the culmination of our salvation okay so Oh, okay. Um, so we'll we'll get into antichrists and all that stuff, um, because scripture speaks singular and plural. Oh, yeah, yeah, antichrist. So, um, so yeah. Okay, Matthew twenty-five. Okay, Ooh, okay. Let's hurry up. We all know this one, I think, but let's hear it. The kingdom of heaven will be like. So, in other words, he. Jesus isn't describing earthly things, kingdom of heaven, but he's using earthly things we can kind of understand. We'll be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. So they're all part of the, they're all part of the waiting, uh, wedding party, right? Um, and, they, oh, well, he's going to show up. We have enough oil, and, right? But, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. At midnight? No, no. But, okay. Yeah. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. See, see, see that word play there? Um, so, um, okay. So, the five who were foolish, why were they foolish? Unprepared. Unprepared. So they didn't bring extra oil. Okay. So uh, in this scenario, the bridegroom came way later than expected. Right? And it's like, oh, 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 no. Right? Um, both fell asleep. Right? You go, well, shouldn't they all be awake waiting? Right? But five had the extra oil they needed and five didn't so um and that right there is like these these were not prepared and and these ones were and so it's like it could be tomorrow it could be a long time right so in this particular parable right it was a lot longer than expected and they all fell asleep but right the ones who were truly prepared had the oil okay <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, no, I'm, uh, we don't want to, you know, parables are, we don't want to overread this, okay? And if we, because these are, you're, Jesus uses things that people back then could relate to. We don't have this scenario today, where, right? But the point, I, the point is being ready, right? Yeah, but the well, Okay, yeah. <laughs> which means none of them were as ready as they should have been, yeah. right? But still, some had oil and some didn't, which means, so we could overthink it, but okay, let's run with it. Well, you know, weren't they supposed to be vigilant? Weren't they supposed to, right? So then you go, so they sinned. Yeah, right? Which 
would mean, I don't want to go push this too far because that's not the main point. <laughs> the main point is, uh, are you prepared? Yes or no, right? And so this is different scenarios to show who wasn't prepared and who was. But okay, both fell asleep, but they were still let in, okay? Um, so the thing is, the oil represents the faith, right? So they all started out with faith, all of them sinned, but who had faith when the, when the bridegroom still returned? The ones who were prepared. The ones who weren't prepared didn't. Their faith ran out. And, well, you go and get some, well, it's midnight and, you know, you can't get any. I mean, that's part of the absurdity is if you're listening, if we're listening to it and we're the first people, oh, we can't, right? So, you, you know, in other words, it's something that you can't do. So, so the point is what? Be prepared, right? So, and that's the point that's being made. I could tell, like, uh, I still don't like it. I could see your gears, like, right? So, um, okay. Well, yeah, that's true, but had the oil. So, um, I mean, I kind of like that because you would think, oh, I'm vigilant and this and this and that. And so, um, you know, it just shows that what? That that we'll all slip up somewhere. But the, but the ones who were prepared will st still let in. Okay. Um, mm. Oh, at least emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the. Um, well, let's finish this and then. Okay. So, um, down at the very bottom, uh, what oil must we keep in our lamps? Well, it's faith. Well, how do we, right? Word and sacrament. See? So every week we come here and we get the oil that we need. That's the way Jesus set it up. Okay? So, um, he's actually giving the goods. Um, and well, then it makes sense why Jesus instituted the church. Yeah, he's actually he's actually nourishing us for our lives here, right? To bring us home to eternity. Um, so, uh, so the ending hymn that I have for today. I'm trying to pick ones that match. So, come thou long expected Jesus Advent hymn. Born to set your people free from our fears and sins, release us, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. So that's the. Uh, but um, so the idea is how do we live our lives as if Christ could return? What does that mean? We do the stuff God has given us to do. Right? We don't stop. Right? Because it may be 10,000 years from now, but it could be tomorrow. But we always know that he could return. So the scenario in Matthew, right? They're in their field doing their job. One's taken, one's forgiven. So it's not like they're doing their everyday stuff. That's what we do. Well, you look at who or who's your neighbor, who's around you. I mean, your skill sets and abilities. I mean, that's the whole idea of vocation, right? And then you can kind of say, okay, well, this is where I am and this is how I serve. So, you know, we could do a series on vocation later if you want. But let's finish in time. Okay. Uh, any thoughts, discussion, or okay? So this was just really we live, being ready for Christ's return. How do we do that? We live the lives God has given us to live. Two were in the field, right? Two guys. Two women were blah blah blah. That's how we live. Okay. Always aware it could be any moment. Okay. Next week, we'll continue on. Still won't get to a mill, pre mill, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, may our hearts and minds always be attuned that your Son may return at any moment. And as that kind of shapes our actions and thoughts, may it do it in a good way so that people can see, us, can see you through us as we do the things you have given us to do. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.